This is a block diagram drawn by Ken Clark and Jeff Tepper over at the University of Puget Sound. And there's lots going on with not only this image, but lots involving the last days of the Kula plate, the transition to the Farallon plate subducting, a change in the position of volcanoes in the Pacific Northwest. And um, I've made some progress trying to visualize this. Andy, Jeff, Mike, if you could give me a few moments here uh, to hear where I am currently, I'd interested in two things. Of course, I'm interested in what you see as uh, major errors in what I'm uh, putting together mentally and visually. And secondly, if there's anything that I'm doing that actually sheds a few pieces of light uh, on the Pacific Northwest. Because at least for me, I've made some um, connections between places that I never made before. Maybe you've been there a while ago, but for me, it's brand new and quite exciting. So here's my current approach with the demise of the Kula Plate and the Chalice Volcanism. We start, hang with me now, we start 98 million years ago. What do we have on this map? We have the Kula Plate, number one. We do not have the Farallon Plate. That's new to me. So the Kula Plate is subducting, probably kind of to the northeast. And these belts here have a big swing to them, mostly because of stuff that's happened uh, recently. Ex extension of the basin and range down here, some other things. So we can't deal with that. Let's just ignore that. Let's also ignore Baja BC. I'm a, I'm a firm believer in the Baja BC story, but let's pretend that doesn't exist for the most part with these sketches. Instead, I really want to just focus on the fact that we used to have a volcanic arc in Idaho, and now we have a volcanic arc in the Cascades. But it's not uh, an easy transition to go from volcanic arc here to volcanic arc where we know it today. And that's what I'm trying to tell. So to set the stage, uh, we have the Idaho batholith. We have other batholiths along this belt to tell us this is good, uh, well-behaved volcanic arc activity, subduction of the Kula Plate. I've tried to approximate the coastline at this time. I'm picking Walla Walla. Uh, the trench is offshore of that. Okay, so we've got new high-precision dates to say that in the Idaho Batholith, at least, these are our dates, and everything shuts down. The last of the volcanism in the Idaho Arc shuts down 53 million years ago, and this is a compressional story, uh, and what you see is what you get. Okay? Great. Now, the next major chapter is the main menu for this new lecture that I'm working on, and this is what has me jazzed pretty substantially at the moment. We shut off the Idaho Arc. Those volcanoes are die uh, are are gone. They're died. Those volcanoes are died. Wow. And 53 to 44 million years ago, which is the window of time we're talking about, where all this action is happening, we get some weirdness, and that's an understatement. Um, the first major part of the weirdness is we lose the arc. The arc just stops. And we don't really have a sudden arc showing up further to the west. Instead, we have this widely diffuse area of magmas that are not arc magmas. The chemistry of these magmas, whether they're plutons or whether they're volcanics, um, show that it's not an arc story. Uh, we're far east enough uh, to get into the Absaricas and the Chalice Volcanic Field and this thing which I don't know anything about, or this thing which I don't know anything about. But the point is, and this is what I'm most excited about right now, those Eocene volcanics of the Tianue Formation, the Ohanapakash Formation, the Natchez Formation, uh, have always been just a little postage stamp in my mind, like doing their own thing, and like question marks, and I don't know why, I don't know why. Well, now I realize, I think, that if we call all of these things just the chalice magmas, and that's a, a bastardization once we cross the border, but 
basically we're getting all these blobs coming to the surface roughly at the same time, roughly at the same time for the purpose of this first part of the story. And this is all happening roughly at the same time that we're bringing in Celestia. So Celestia comes in, the timing of this is we lose the arc and we get all these volcanics here. These volcanics and magmas are not arc, instead it's hot mantle coming to the surface creating relatively shallow magma bodies and we're creating gold. We're creating gold at damn near every one of these places. The chalice gold, the liberty gold, there's gold over in the Absaricas, there's gold up here as well. I didn't make that connection before, I'm very excited about it. Is that accurate? Is there gold and uh, extension and core complexes with damn near everything you see here? If that's the case, we need to come up with a tectonic model to explain all these blobs coming up regionally during this window at the time that Celeste is coming in. Notice our trench has jumped to the west. Let's finish the story at least at this first pass by getting to a familiar story where now the Idaho Arc is, is dead, the Chalice guys are dead, and now in the last 44 million years we set up shop with the Volcanic Arc and the Cascades, which originally was a continuous line, and we now know that that Cascade Volcanic Arc is now uh, shortened as we continue to lose the Farallon Plate. Okay, that's the first broad pass. Now, what does that look like in cross-section? This is my attempt this morning to do that. So if we go back 98 million years ago, which is at this time, we have our Kula plate. Again, new to me, I thought that was always the Farallon. It's the Kula plate subducting, creating the Idaho arc. Okay. Uh, we can throw in the whiz and all sorts of uh, strike-slip behavior, but we're uh, going to basically ignore that. But that's obviously happening at the same time that all the rest of this stuff is happening. But again, let's ignore the translation north with these blocks. Uh, by 70 million years ago, we still have this really well, uh, relatively well-behaved volcanic arc in Idaho. Uh, but uh oh we're about to go nuts. So in the, in the waning stages of this Idaho arc story, you know, we're approaching 53. 53 is the magic number. We still have our coolest story uh, uh, generating those magmas. Now, all hell breaks loose 53 million years ago. What's going on? So let's see, is approaching the coast. It's still erupting magmas, by the way. Thank you, Andy, for that. And... Notice that we have a major break of this old Kula plate. We actually take a slab and break it off from the rest of the Kula plate. And so for the first time, this is the tectonic model that is favored by many, as I understand it. Please help me if I'm wrong. We've got uh, a way to get some hot mantle rocks up through this subducting plate and generating shallow magmas to start creating these chalice volcanoes. Chalice meaning all these guys, not just the true chalice volcanics in uh, central Idaho. We're bringing Celestia in. By 49, we get docking of Celestia, and we are breaking the Kula again. And specifically, there are some rocks in Washington that show that second break. So now we've got two remnant pieces of the former Kula plate. And also notice we're switching names because we realize it's an actual spreading ridge that's approaching the margin as opposed to just a simple plate. So we need a different way to tell that story. Uh, to finish this, we get to a more well-behaved cascade arc uh, as we know it today. And here's our two pieces of the Kula that are still down there beneath Idaho and Montana, but we're feeding the Cascades and Westport is our coast. Okay, to me that works pretty well cartoonishly, but now the devil's in the details, of course, 
because if we actually go to those quote-unquote chalice magmas in Washington, of course we have to get out of the flood basalt's cow pie, we need to get to these magmas and volcanics that Tepper and students and Eddie has been visiting and getting high precision dates. The main message that got me interested in this topic to begin with is Eddie's map, show, excuse me, well, it's Eddie and Tepper. Uh, Tepper primarily showing us that there is a sweep, that these chalice magmas are getting from 52 million years ago to 44 million years ago and sweeping from northeast to southwest through Washington. How can you explain that sweep? And remember, these are not, these chalice magmas, these chalice magmas are not the arcs. There's this weird kind of all hell breaks loose chapter. So how can we explain this, this migration or this sweep of ages, 52 to 44, as we go from northeast to southwest? That's the last thing I'm going to show you, uh, which is, uh, shit, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. So here's Tepper's attempt to explain with Ken Clark uh, how this potentially looked. So 52, remember now, we're just starting our, our explanation of these blotches. Um, we have this spreading ridge between Kula and Farallon, and North America encroaching over it. Tepper has a big jump with transform plates, uh, plate boundaries, uh, getting this spreading ridge offset in this manner. But the point is the Klarna is starting to show up because we're developing, uh, we're subducting the ridge. Everything north is the Kula, everything south is the Farallon. So we're getting some of that um, mantle, hot mantle coming closer to the surface to generate these weird magmas. That's just the beginning of this story. And notice that we're doing a slab rollback. I guess I forgot to comment on that. But you probably notice that we're starting a rollback of the Farallon plate uh, as we approach Celestia coming in. Here's where the block diagrams from Tepper and um, Clark help us out. This is what we started with at this video. And we're showing at 49 million years ago, our second break. So remember now I had us at 49 million years ago, doing a second break of this subducting plate. And the evidence for that second break is some specific uh, volcanics in the Snoqualmie Pass area, including the Tianway Basalt, I might add, all in the neighborhood, let's just say 49 for simplicity. At 49 million years ago, we have a, an abrupt arrival of a bunch of magmas coming to the surface. Tepper and Clark, and maybe Eddie, uh, probably Eddie, assume this is a second break of the subducting plate. So here's Ken Clark showing us, uh, can I show both of these? I guess I can, kind of. Are these both appearing? Hopefully they are. So as we subduct the ridge, fine. But to get this batch of stuff at 49 million years ago in the Snoqualmie Pass area, which Tepper calls the break-off belt, we're breaking that slab again to allow these magmas to come to the surface. We don't see those kinds of break-off belt rocks in Oregon, primarily because of the flood basalts, but even if we could, Tepper's telling us that we didn't break that slab a second time in Oregon and further south. That's just good old-fashioned Farallon plate continuing to do its thing. So we roll back and break off at 49 million years ago uh, to explain that story. And finally, once we get to something a little bit more recent in the story, Celestia has accreted... We're done with our, we're approaching to be done with our chalice story. Here's the actual slab. Can you see it? Here's the actual slab that's hanging. Uh, oh 
So these, these things, this first piece that broke off, or maybe the second piece, I'm not sure. Which of these pieces is the slab curtain that's hanging beneath Idaho? But here's Ken showing us, I guess it's the second one. Here's this, the, the, the break off at 49 million years ago, and here's this slab hanging beneath Idaho today. And the fact that we have Celestia accreted uh, it makes good sense to us, uh, hopefully. And then we finish back with our most basic story, which is a diagram I can't find. Hey, man. Thanks for listening.